Marilyn Monroe, born in obscurity and deprivation, became an actress and legend of the 20th century, romantically linked to famous men from Joe DiMaggio to Arthur Miller to John F. Kennedy. But her tragic death at a young age, under suspicious circumstances, left behind a mystery that remains unsolved to this day. Famous for playing comedic blonde bombshell characters, Marilyn Monroe became one of the most popular sex symbols of the 1950s and early 1960s and was emblematic of the era's sexual revolution. Marilyn Monroe, whose original name was Norma Jean Mortensen and later called Norma Jean Baker, was born on June 1st, 1926 in Los Angeles, California. She was an American actress who became a major sex symbol, starring in a number of commercially successful films during the 1950s, and who is considered a pop culture icon. Her mother was frequently confined in an asylum, and Norma Jean was reared by 12 successive sets of foster parents and, for a time, in an orphanage. In 1942, at the age of 16, she married a fellow worker in an aircraft factory, though they divorced soon after World War II. She became a popular photographer's model and in 1946 signed a short-term contract with 20th Century Fox, taking as her screen name Marilyn Monroe. After a few brief appearances in movies made by the Fox and Columbia Studios, she was again unemployed and she returned to modeling for photographers. Her nude photograph on a calendar brought her a role in the film Scudder Who, Scudder Hay in 1948, which was followed by other minor roles. In 1950, Munro played a small, uncredited role in the asphalt jungle that reaped a mountain of fan mail. An appearance in All About Eve in 1950 won her another contract from Fox and much recognition. In a succession of movies, including Let's Make It Legal in 1951, Love Nest also in 1951, Clash By Night in 1952, and Niagara in 1953, she advanced to star billing on the strength of her studio-fostered image as a love goddess. During this period, Munro gained a reputation for being difficult to work with, which would worsen as her career progressed. She was often late or did not show up at all, did not remember her lines and would demand several retakes before she was satisfied with her performance. Her dependence on her acting coaches, Natasha Leitis and then Paula Strasberg, also irritated directors. Munro's problems have been attributed to a combination of perfectionism, low self-esteem and stage fright. She disliked her lack of control on film sets and never experienced similar problems during photo shoots in which she had more say over her performance and could be more spontaneous instead of following a script. To alleviate her anxiety and chronic insomnia, she began to use barbiturates, amphetamines and alcohol, which also exacerbated her problems, although she did not become severely addicted until 1956. Some of Munro's behaviour, especially later in her career, was also in response to the condescension and sexism of her male co-stars and directors. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to remember this if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content. Similarly, biographer Lois Banner had stated that she was bullied by many of her directors. With performances in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes in 1953 and How to Marry a Millionaire also in 1953 and There's No Business Like Show Business in 1954, her fame grew steadily and spread throughout the world and she became the object of unprecedented popular adulation. In 1954, she married baseball star Joe DiMaggio and the attendant publicity was enormous. With the end of their marriage less than a year later, she began to grow discontented with her career. Munro studied with Lee Strasberg at the Actors Studio in New York City and in the Seven Year Itch in 1955 and Bus Stop in 1956, she began to emerge as a talented comedian. 
1956, she married playwright Arthur Miller and briefly retired from movie making. Although she co-starred with Laurence Olivier in The Prince and the Showgirl in 1957. She won critical acclaim for the first time as a serious actress for Some Like It Hot in 1959. Her last film, the drama The Misfits in 1961, was written by Miller specifically for Munro, though their marriage disintegrated during production and they divorced in 1961. In 1962, Munro began filming the comedy Something's Got to Give. However, she was frequently absent from the set because of illnesses, and in May, she traveled to New York City to attend a gala where she famously sang Happy Birthday to President John F. Kennedy, with whom she was allegedly having an affair. In June, Munro was fired from the film. Although she was later rehired, work never resumed. After several months as a virtual recluse, Munro died from an overdose of sleeping pills in her Los Angeles home. Her death was ruled a probable suicide, and this finding was supported by the actress's history of drug use and previous suicide attempts. However, some believed that she had been killed after threatening to reveal her relationship with the Kennedy brothers. She was also rumored to have had an affair with U.S. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, or that she had information linking the two men to organized crime. Although there was insufficient evidence to support these claims, conspiracy theories persisted. In their first runs, Munro's 23 movies grossed a total of more than $200 million, and her fame surpassed that of any other entertainer of her time. Her early image as a dumb and seductive blonde gave way in later years to the tragic figure of a sensitive and insecure woman unable to escape the pressures of Hollywood. Her vulnerability and sensuousness combined with her needless death eventually raised her to the status of an American cultural icon. During her final months, Munro lived in the Brentwood neighborhood of Los Angeles. Her housekeeper, Eunice Murray, was staying overnight at the home on the evening of August 4, 1962. Murray awoke at 3 a.m. on August 5th and sensed that something was wrong. She saw light from under Munro's bedroom door but was unable to get a response and found the door locked. Murray then called Munro's psychiatrist, Ralph Greenson, who arrived at the house shortly after and broke into the bedroom through a window to find Munro dead in her bed. Munro's physician, Hyman Engelberg, arrived at around 3.50am and pronounced her dead at the scene. Munro died between 8.30pm and 10.30pm on August the 4th, and the toxology report showed that the cause of death was acute barbiturate poisoning. Empty medicine bottles were found next to her bed. The possibility that Munro had accidentally overdosed was ruled out because the dosages found in her body were several times over the lethal limit. Munro's doctors stated that she had been prone to severe fears and frequent depressions with abrupt and unpredictable mood changes and had overdosed several times in the past, possibly intentionally. Due to these facts and the lack of any indication of foul play, Deputy Coroner Thomas Noguchi classified her death as a probable suicide. Munro's sudden death was front page news in the United States and Europe it's said that the suicide rate in Los Angeles doubled that month after she died, the circulation rate of most newspapers expanded that month, and the Chicago Tribune reported that they had received hundreds of phone calls from members of the public requesting information about her death. Her funeral, held at the Westwood Village Memorial Park Cemetery on August the 8th, was private and attended by only her closest associates. The service was arranged by Joe DiMaggio, Munro's half-sister Bernice Baker, and Munro's business manager. Hundreds of spectators crowded the streets around the cemetery, and Munro was later entombed at Crypt No. 24 at the Corridor of Memories. She was just 36 years old. Munro's enduring popularity is tied to her conflicted public image. On one hand, she remains a sex symbol, beauty icon, and one of the most famous stars of classical Hollywood cinema. On the other, 
She is also remembered for her troubled private life, unstable childhood, and struggle for professional respect, as well as her death and the conspiracy theories that surround it. Although Munro's screen persona as a dim-witted but sexually attractive blonde was a carefully crafted act, audiences and film critics believed it to be her real personality. This became a hindrance when she wanted to pursue other kinds of roles or to be respected as a businesswoman. The biggest myth is that she was dumb. The second is that she was fragile. The third is that she couldn't act. She was far from dumb. She was not formally educated and she was very sensitive about that, but she was very smart indeed and very tough. She had to be both to beat the Hollywood studio system in the 1950s. Now it's time to hear from you. Do you have a favourite Marilyn Monroe movie or perhaps a scene in one of her movies that you like the most? Let us know in the comments below and if you haven't already done so, click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content.